of a wartime veteran. The surviving spouse is somebody who was married to a wartime veteran at the time of his death, okay? If you were divorced from him when he passed away, you are his ex-wife. You are not the surviving spouse. So to get off the starting blocks, you have to have been married to a wartime veteran at the time of his death. And today, you cannot have remarried. The reason I say in today is because that rule changed on November 1st, 1990. So somebody who was married to a veteran and they died, let's say in the early 70s, and they married somebody in the 70s who wasn't a veteran, and that person passed away prior to November 1st, 1990, they can go back to their prior veteran husband's service. But if that person passed away on November 2nd, 1990, they cannot. Okay, because the law changed. What we like to tell people is, you know, don't try to ever share this information and accidentally tell somebody no. Go ahead and just have them give us a call. Their first phone call is free. We tell people all the time that um, married, remarried um, situation, and we have had many times when people have been told no, they don't qualify for it, and we've been able to say, hey, that second marriage ended in such a way or at the right time that you can go back and get the benefit. Okay, so the medical requirement, that is um, where you get rated as needing aid in attendance. Okay, it's very much a medical diagnosis. Similar to you either have diabetes or you do not. You either need the aid in attendance of another person or you do not. Okay, so some of the things, and a lot of times People will refer to it as activities of daily living. And we like to say if you're a doctor, nurse, social worker, and you think you know what an activity of daily living is, you need to throw it out the window because the VA has their own definitions. Okay? The most important thing being activity of daily living, daily doesn't mean every day. Who would have thought that? Right? So we have people who you have to need the assistance of another person with at least two activities of daily living. All right. A lot of our seniors um, might, you know, sponge bathe and might only take a shower once a week or every other week. And when they take that full shower, somebody's doing a standby assist. That's an activity of daily living, even though it might only happen once or twice a month. Okay? So somebody who's getting a standby assist with a shower, generally the person who's doing that standby assist doesn't leave while they're in their towel in wet. They stay and maybe assist them a little bit with dressing. They might not think of it as assisting with dressing, but if they're there making sure that they get dressed safely, that's a standby assist with dressing, and we're at our two activities of daily living. Um, the VA recently implemented that it has to be two activities of daily living over and above what the VA calls independent activities of daily living, and that is meal preparation, transportation, housekeeping, and medication reminders. We used to be able to get the benefit for people by saying, hey, they're unsafe around the stove and they have to be reminded to take their medication. Those days are over. Now we need to come up with two things that are over and above those. So medication management, meaning that somebody doesn't just get reminded to take their pills, but they have to be dispensed to them. That is going to be an activity of daily living. Um, somebody who occasionally like after they've been sitting at the meal maybe someone from the assisted living staff gives them a hand to get up every now and then like let's say they use a walker or a cane and they just need a little help standing up that's assistance with mobility and that's an activity of daily living um, somebody who maybe has arthritis in their hands and if they're serving chicken or um, steak people in the kitchen have to cut it up for them first that would be assistance with eating 
Any? Oh, I, Arthur doesn't let me ask if nope. you guys have questions. Only me. Okay, <laughs> so uh, the rules are. Hey, it's my presentation. So, but by the way, this, this this is a good time to interject. So, you know, if there are a lot of fields where where I've got, I always tell people, you know, I only do what I do. I do a little thing. Right? Th this I don't do, and so I and, and I don't do a lot of things, right? And so always I have to say, well, you know, here are the three people that I can suggest, and blah blah blah. blah. In the veterans area, there aren't really three. There's only Patty because there's nobody that I've ever met that really kind of grasps this um, as, as the way that Patty does. This is just a short. Point. Well, I think he should follow me around all the time and just interject little pleasantries <laughs> about me, right? As my mom would say, "Did you get a voice recording?" <laughs> okay. So the rules at home. The reason there's this distinction between home and assisted living and um, nurse uh, with rules and in independent living and assisted living is because in order to be able to treat your assisted living or your independent living fee as a medical expense, you have to be able to prove that you are receiving assistance with at least two activities of daily living. When you're at home, if you're receiving home care, it's a little bit more lax because they say, all right, you're having somebody come in and you're getting an expense for that and no matter what, we're never going to let you ded deduct your mortgage, your taxes, your food bill, right? So they're really just about deducting that little home care cost where with assisted living and independent living, we need those two activities of daily living if we want to be able to um, have the VA consider the cost of the independent living and the assisted living. Okay, so the income test. This is a means-based test. And I kind of do this in order, right? If you're not a veteran of a wartime or you weren't the surviving spouse of a wartime veteran, you can't go to the next step. If you haven't, um, if you don't need the assistance of another person with at least two activities of daily living, then the income test is going to be very difficult to pass. So what is the income test? For the most part, it's everything that most of us think of as income. Social security, pensions, some annuity income, interest, dividends, oil well royalties, rental income from your second home. Anything that you can think of other than SSI, which is basically your welfare payments, is going to, or VA compensation payments, are going to be considered for this test for income, okay? But, so we all agree we know what income is, but that is not income for VA purposes, all right? Income for VA purposes is everything that we agree is income minus what you pay to the assisted living as long as you meet those criteria we were talking about. So, I need to update the slide to do math that I can handle. I did it quickly. I can't believe I didn't update it since the Nantucket thing when I first saw it. I have to use round numbers. I was a CPA at Price Waterhouse and I can't do math in my head because I used a calculator for forever, right? So what we're gonna use for our example is 3,000 a month in income and 4000 to the assisted living, okay? So we're negative $1,000. I can handle that math. So when you have negative income for VA purposes, and it has an acronym, so you know it's true, IVAP, income, VA purposes, or IVAP. If you have zero or negative income for VA purposes, you've passed the income test with an indication of getting the full benefit, which, as we said before, 1113 for a surviving spouse, 1732 for a veteran and 2054 for a married couple. And I always tell people this is the most important thing you're going to take away from this speech today. Because I've given this speech before and I've had somebody call me the next day and said, hey, surveys, I just called the VA and I want to know what game you're playing because they told me my dad was never going to qualify. He's a very gruff guy. And I said, well, why don't you tell me what uh, you said to the VA? And he goes, funny enough, your example. Yeah. And I said, well, why don't you tell me what you said to the VA? He goes, I told them my dad makes $3,000. They asked what his income was. I told them he makes $3,000 a month, $36,000 a year. And they told me he was never going to qualify. I didn't say anything. And he went, Hello, are you still there? And I said, yes, I'm waiting for the part where you told them that he pays $4,000 a month to the assisted living, so his income's really negative $1,000, negative $12,000 a year. And he goes, 
I didn't say that. I gotta go. And he hung up. Okay? So it's up to all of you to remember that if someone from the VA says, what's your income? You have to minus out the cost of your assisted living fee, your home care, etc. Okay? Medical insurance premiums get minused out. Everything that is a regularly occurring, unreimbursed medical expense, except your prescriptions. So your assisted living fee, your medical insurance premiums, if you have um, kidney issues and go to dialysis, anything that an insurance company isn't reimbursing you for, all right? So um, what happens if, you, it, well, I always say this part, what if it's flip-flopped, okay? What if you have $4,000 a month in income and you're paying $3,000 to your um, assisted living? Now you're left positive $1,000. What is there for you? Well, the VA will say, in a surviving spouse situation, the max pension is 1113 You have $1,000 free and clear, so I'm going to minus that out, and I'll give you $113 a month. Okay? Now, I've had some folks say to me, $113 a month? That's not even worth filling out the paperwork for. I say, are you kidding me? You know how much paperwork I've done in my life? You know how many times I filled out paperwork and it resulted in someone giving me $113 a month for the rest of my life? Zero times, okay? So number one, I think it's worth it. Number two, when you're in the program, then when your situation changes, it's easy to say, oh, now I am in an assisted living and now my medical expenses are this, or remember how I said not prescriptions? If you're in this program and you've left $1,000 a month on the table or $500 a month on the table, whatever it is, at the end of the year, you can submit all of your non-regularly occurring medical expenses to the VA that you spent for the whole year and they will reimburse you dollar for dollar until you've eaten up all that money. So in our example, if you left $1,000 on the table, at the end of the year, you would say, hey, I bought new eyeglasses, $200. They'd say, okay, here's $200 out of the $12,000 you left. Every doctor's copay, every prescription copay, hearing aids, depends, vitamins, anything that's medically related. Okay? 